Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of the Q&A. So, uh, we did one of these last week, there was a lot of discussion uh, on the topic of Traherne and his place in the expansion. You know, I've been pretty confident in myself saying, oh, you know, he's gonna get corrupted by Morgamoth, we're gonna end up fighting him, and it's gonna be the greatest story ever. And there's actually been a fair amount of discussion on that idea. Turns out many of you guys don't even like it. Wow, uh, what can I say? I feel betrayed, guys. Come on, this is clearly the best story that could possibly have of Thorns. But some of you do uh, actually raise some really interesting points. Um, I suppose in a lot of ways it is very similar to what they did with Prince Rurik in Guild Wars 1. Though he never really came to my mind. You see, yes, I guess the Prince Rurik returning thing was similar. But let's face it, Prince Rurik, um, his reappearance at the end of the story... There really wasn't very much weight behind that. I mean, yes, it was a big shock. Oh, this was the guy from the start. And oh, we haven't thought about Ascalon in those old days for a long time. But that's just the thing. Prince Rurik was barely a part of the story for ages. And the actual Flame Seeker prophecy section of prophecies. I've always maintained prophecies was kind of two different stories. One, it was about the fall of As Ascalon. And then second, it was about the Flame Seeker prophecies. He was actually mostly absent and he just popped up again. And what I'm proposing they would do with Traherne, he would be a constant uh, enemy for us and a constant reminder of what's going on and constantly haranguing us and uh, you know being in the picture anyway there's been a lot of people a lot of people like the idea a lot of people don't like the idea and that's uh, pretty cool I wonder whether um, arena net see that and uh, the ultimate story we get will not be so easily predicted anyway so uh, let's move on to some new questions if you guys would like to have your questions appear in this series all you have to do is leave them down in the comments below so if I say something this episode that makes you want to ask a question just drop it down there and I'll be reading them I read them all uh, before the episode for next week first one comes from goose my berry who says do you think the dragon will fight after Morgamoth would be Primordus considering they both seem to be close to each other maybe at the end of the Morgamoth fight the trees would get burned and scorched to show Primordus have sucked Morgamoth's powers like how nature stuffs grew after the fight with Zaitan. And if so, what do you think this, of the state Primordus is in now? You know, I actually think that Primordus is a really good candidate for the next Elder Dragon after Morgamoth. There's another question I never ended up choosing for this video, um, in which someone said, hey, what do you think if the next story after Heart of Thorns involves um, Jormag and uh, Primordus fighting one another? You know, the Fire Dragon, the Ice Dragon going head to head. And that would be pretty cool. I do think that the next expansion they do after um, Morgamoth, it would be nice to change things up a little from you know this kind of idea that we have we're all fighting a dragon who's out to get us which is the same as what we had for Zaitan so I do think the next expansion they are they could do something like elder dragons versing one another the fire and the ice dragon going against one another is great and Primordus is a wonderful segue from the Morgamoth art here see if you guys aren't really familiar with the region there's two things going on here um, there's something that's been sapping the life away and turning into a wasteland as we saw there were wasted areas in the first game and until Morgamoth woke up through the actions of Scarlet Briar. What was it? Wasn't the Maguma Jungle? That's not what we were calling it. We were calling it the Maguma Wastes. And ArenaNet did confirm, even before launch, a long time ago, they said, hey, um, the increased desertification of this region of the world can be attributed to um, the Elder Dragons. You know, so this is some byproduct of the Elder Dragons. And so knowing this, we have two Elder Dragons, it seems, vying sort of over the same area. We have one guy that's destroying it all a lot and lives underground, Primordus. And we have Morgamoth, who they've also now announced is living underground, but uh, is flushing it with lush life and vegetation. Of course, neither are really situations we want to be in. And now that Morgamoth's awoken, he's completely undone whatever it seems Primordus may have done over the past 250 years. Um, and so this would be a great segue. You know, yeah, maybe Morgamoth does die and Primordius is like, aha, this was my region, wonderful, and just everything shrivels up and starts to die, and we realize, oh my god, we've now killed two Elder Dragons, there's even more magic seeping around now, everything that Zaitan had and Morgamoth was eating is now flying all over the place, and Primordius is, uh, he's having a feast at the moment, and that could be a great setup. You know, um, one thing that actually really excites me is maybe these ideas I'm discussing right now could come to fruition during the Mordremoth story. Maybe um, things blow up and they start introducing the idea of Primordus in a very real way before Heart of Thorns is even over. 
you know, that's a very exciting idea to me too, that even as we're killing Morgamoth, we know Primordis is around and we know this could be an issue. I don't think it's a coincidence that they said Morgamoth was also in underground just as Primordis was. The only thing I don't really like about this is Primordis was the first one to wake up. And I know in a lot of ways they've made Kraukatoric feel like the most badass dragon, you know, uh, printing this massive scar on the face of the planet. I know that Zaitan rose ore from the depths and so forth, but Kraukatoric, you know, he's even got that person thing against us where he destroyed Destiny's Edge. I know that they kind of make it seem like Krakatorix is a really super badass dragon, but Primordis was the one we saw wake up in Guild Wars 1, or we saw stir in Guild Wars 1. The destroyers were the first to, that began to move. So I kind of always liked the idea that Primordis would be the last we kill, and this of course would take that away. But uh, maybe that's not such a bad thing. If they did an expansion after this that was Jormag versus Primordis, who have we got left, guys? We've just got Steve, the Deep Sea Dragon. Who, God knows what's going to go on there, and we have Kraukatoric. Kraukatoric, perhaps for his own expansion, is some kind of final boss. Kraukatoric located in the Crystal Desert, the Crystal Desert near Alona, perfect segue to other regions. That could be pretty cool, it could be looking pretty good. Um, that seems like a, a good roadmap for them. Anyway, so moving on to the next question, Crimson8 says, Hey WP, what professions do you think will get any taunt abilities with the expansion? Also, do you think it will make tanking more viable or stop at least the uh, limit the all Zerker squads? Um, now to the second part of that question, whether this is going to stop all Zerker all the time, you know, they've definitely not come out and said, oh, we want to destroy all Zerker all the time. They haven't said that. And don't forget, of course, that you can also run Zerker while still making use of hard mechanics like taunts. So um, I'm not sure whether just because taunts are going to exist, we can say 100% that all Zerk is going to go away. Obviously, for me, the dream is more uh, build diversity in the gear we see and having very tanky people who also maybe have high condition duration so they can land these massive long taunts on huge groups of enemies is a cool idea. Uh, people who say adding tankiness to gear makes the game face roll or uninteresting removes Twitch elements, I think are fundamentally wrong. But whether this will be a reality is based very very heavily on the effectiveness the cooldowns of the taunt skills that they add and the actual content they produce as well how much it even calls for taunt if we can still los the crap out of everything then it's probably going to be pre preferable to control mobs in that way than using taunt so we'll see um but the idea of picking out which specializations may get taunt is a fun one to me I think it's very likely that the Revenant specialization will have taunt, especially considering the base class has taunt. I believe that the Guardian specialization absolutely will get taunt. In fact, I think whatever he specializes is into will be themed very much around that kind of tanky idea. I wouldn't be surprised if even the name of the specialization was some kind of very, it was like Defender or something ridiculous like that. And the idea of having all these really powerful, potent, taunting, tanking style stuff was a big part of the class. I think those two are pretty much a given. I think um, Warrior specialization could end up with it, but if it is this kind of very glassy, kind of rampaging style character that's going to be using daggers, as I predicted in a previous video, maybe that doesn't work so well, you know, and I don't think necessarily all three heavy armor classes getting torn um, is something that they would end up doing, so actually I think Warrior is slightly less likely than the other two. Uh, for Squishies, I think um, Mesmer would be a very quick one to say, oh, this guy's probably going to get taunt. Um, because Mesmer's always been about controlling the enemies, right? But I'm so sure in the Chronomancer idea, I'm so sure in that, uh, and with the addition of the new, um, condition anyway, slow, I think slow is going to be a big theme of the Chronomancer, rather than taunt, and I think because slow's already there, there could be a bit of overlapping, and maybe we won't see it on Mesmer. There's a chance we could see it on Elementalist, especially with the data mining, suggesting we'll get, uh, probably a sword, maybe axe, uh, something close range for Elementalist, some kind of taunt would be cool so instead of gap closing the elementalist is trying to pull people closer to them and lastly of course we've got the necromancer it could be a thing taunt is like you know it's the opposite of fear and necromancers are all about fear so will they then get taunt I don't know. Uh, and then lastly, for the mediums, I think um, the engineer is probably a likely one that may get some taunt, uh, especially considering we know, once again, they're going to be kind of melee with their hammers running around. Thief, even if it's not a sniper, as some people are now saying we don't really want to see snipers, I doubt that thieves will end up getting taunt, but I think it is also likely that rangers, uh, or druids rather, 
could be taunting in some way, though nothing too massive. I don't know, that's an interesting idea. You pick kind of uh, one mechanic and see how that's, uh, one new mechanic at that, and see how it's spread across the other classes. We might do some more of that with uh, some of the other boons, conditions, and things uh, coming up. Next question is from Thalandor46, who says, do you think the entire Heart of Thorns story will be available at launch, or do you think Arena Net will release it in parts over time like they did with Living World storylines? I think people would feel incredibly gypped for cash if uh, they bought Heart of Thorns, they didn't even get the story, you know, and then it's like, oh, we have to wait, we have to wait, we have to wait, even though it's gated behind Heart No, 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 people aren't going to be happy with that. Oh, we're going to get a full story. We're going to get a full story, and it's going to end, you know, with Mordor Moth being destroyed, in my opinion. And I think they're going to put a lot more effort into destroying into that final fight and the end of the story and where the story's going from here than they did um, with the initial story arc at the start of the game. I think uh, the really interesting thought is, what is the next living world? What is Living World Season 3? What are they bridging to from that point? And it's very exciting for me to think that they must have that planned out. You know, they must already know how Heart of Thorns is going to end. They must have it planned out. We had um, a guy on Point of Interest just recently say, hey, I worked out all the story two years ago. You know, the general narrative we're in now. They know where they're going. And um, yeah, I think we're going to get all of Mordor Moth in the expansion, guys. And then we're going to get another bridge. We're going to get another Living World thing. And those will be the rolling updates. Dream World as well, for what it's worth, ArenaNet fly into Living World Season 3 within a month of release. Now, I've had some very lofty expectations lately. You guys can look back at some of the ridiculous things I said just before Heart of Thorns was properly announced at PAX South with, like, the scope of the expansion. But this is something I think is really important. They don't want people coming in for the expansion and then flooding away straight away. Um, if people come back for Heart of Thorns as it releases, and they know, you know, it's there on the patch screen, it's there on everyone, the, the tip of everyone's tongues throughout the game, are uh, just a month till the story continues. You know, they finish, they defeat the, the um, Elder Dragon, and they've got a few specializations to work on. They know very soon this living world is going to start rolling instantly. I think that's incredibly important. If they end up waiting like four, five months, oh, that's, uh, that's not going to be good, and I think they're going to lose their audience again very 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 fast it's important that living world season 3 rolls out quick hopefully they know how to shift themselves into that mode as fast as possible what you gotta remember as well we had we waited a long time for the living world to begin after launch and that's because they didn't really even conceive of it let alone set up the infrastructure too well um, when the initial game came out Bass Verlding says, how do you think the Soundless will fit into the Mordremoth story arc? I think this is a good question. Uh, the Soundless, of course, for those who don't know, these are Silvari who um, choose to separate themselves from the dream. They don't turn to Nightmare. They're not Nightmare Court. They just... Uh, try to get rid of this hive mind sort of element of the Silvari because they want to be independent and this is a cool idea There's a place in Caledon Forest where mostly this is where you interact with the Soundless. They've got their own little place there um, And of course we already saw in Living World Season 2 that because they had cut uh, at least one of them had cut himself off Aaron this made him very susceptible to Morgamoth, and after Scarlet Briar died, Morgamoth found himself a Soundless Savari to do his deeds, and ultimately the, uh, the Zephyrite fleet got destroyed, much in the same way the Pact fleet has now been destroyed. So, uh, that's already happened, I think a lot more uh, Soundless will fall victim to Morgamoth, and they're just gonna say, yeah, a lot of the Soundless get messed up by this. Does this mean that the location in Caledon Forest will change? I'd like to see that. Uh, when the expansion comes out, and this is exactly the kind of thing they would have done if it was Living World, right? So why wouldn't they do it with the expansion as well? Um, but whether the, we're going to then go into tons more detail about the Sounders, I, I doubt it. Richard Navone says, Hey WP, can you share the Elementalist build you are using? It looks fairly badass. Uh, this is my latest take on Burst Ellie for Scepter Focus. Um, bit of history about me, when it comes to TPVP, I was always running burst ellie and i even played at a pretty high level as well for a while um i would even have like a bit of a team comp going where we had a lot of emobes and stuff and we would be calling spikes we try and bring back that kind of um our way style spike culture that used to exist in guild wars 1 and was so exciting it's very difficult to do in guild wars 2 though just because of the dodge roll let alone all the other random immunities and stuff that pop up all over the place um anyway so i played a lot of this very much enjoyed it eventually got pushed out by the meta though and having done it for a long time since then a lot of things have changed and uh, one of the more uh, interesting traits that's appeared in the game since those days is the uh, blind on burn trait for elementalists now this is a grandmaster fire trait the the idea is um, you can run incredibly incredibly high glass 
but because you are constantly critting with stuff like fresh air that gives you lots of fury and you're on Zerk armor anyway because of course you're trying to burst really high, um, you keep procking blinds on these very dangerous classes that are aggressing you and you can save yourself. And it's a cool idea, you know, uh, you'll see in the, the footage from last uh, week I was even running Signal of Air, you, that's a lot of blinds you get, especially on Scepter and running this trait setup. But the Grandmaster has way too long of a internal cooldown on it in my opinion, so a lot of the time it feels just more rewarding to go pure burst instead of this. And one of the um, hugest counters to this, because you are the squishiest thing in the game, are thieves who can just stealth and honestly like a backstab will just kill you straight away. Uh, especially in World vs Wild where power can be so much higher than it is in TPVP. This really sucks and there's not much of a counter to it at all, you can just uh, pop your obsidian flesh and be invulnerable for a while and hope he engages on you during that but any decent thief will just wait and then they kill you anyway. Um, so the, uh, another thing I really liked about this idea of a build, this burning blinding build, is it actually makes the focus skills on fire attunement worth something or at least the flame wall because you could drop the flame wall in theory and stand in it and now any thief that tries to engage you immediately stands in the flame wall takes a tick of burning and this blinds them and so then they miss their first hit you see the miss appears that they've engaged on you this will waste their bassy and whatever else then you can have your arcane shield up and so forth and it's you still have to be incredibly fast the theory checks out however again there's there's practical issues the flame wall has such a thin hitbox you can barely even hide in it or they'll steal into you just between ticks of the damage or it will be an internal cooldown it's just there's so many messy messy things the skill five still doesn't do anything I maintain 100% all they have to do to make this build viable and make this really fun add a bit of counterplay between Ellie's and thieves in these very bursty uh, situations is on focus 5 fire which is a skill that's supposed to light you up with a big fire shield make that apply revealed in a 900 radius around you for like five seconds to everything around you so if there is a stealth thief waiting biding his time you can wait in the fire wall and then when you pop your skill 5 which is already on a huge long cooldown and a useless skill anyway it It'll put revealed on the thieves around you and um, you actually have some counter play there. They said they were going to put more revealed in the game. And I think this is the perfect skill for it, but uh, I don't know whether it will ever happen. Anyway, it's a fun build. I'm trying to just kill people in World vs. Wild. Might make a montage of it. Fishy332 said, hey WP, what do you think of the Walking Dead finale? And do you think your first ma what do you think your first mastery trait will be that you work on? Walking Dead finale was pretty good. I liked the mid-season finale a little bit more, even though they killed a character in what a lot of people said was a needless fashion. And the first mastery trait I work on, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I really have no idea. I want to fly. I want to be able to access areas. I think what I'll do is I'll just take it easy and um, uh, try and grab whatever makes the game feel most metroidvania-ish, right? Like, I don't want to waste all my time putting points into stuff like precursor crafting really quickly. I'm just gonna get points in things that I feel like I want to explore. And hopefully that will be fun. But yeah, I have no plans right now, and that will be one of the fun things I guess I go into the expansion and just learn about myself. Last question for this video is from Kill Chain, who said, So, given what we know about the expansion so far, what would be your ideal feature pack 3 to help complement what we know is coming in Heart of Thorns? This is a really interesting question, because as soon as I sat down and started thinking about it, especially considering in first person camera and stuff in the game now, I, it was a little bit more tricky for me to think. You know, I used to have all these ideas floating around, um, but there are still a few. To me, the biggest ones um, that I think could happen, and especially in terms of complementing Heart of Thorns, Build templates, uh, if we're saying that feature pack 3 comes out after Heart of Thorns, I think especially given what's happening with PvP, and if Stronghold does end in, but, uh, end up bundled in a queue with um, Conquest, build templates are going to be so, so important and so useful to people. And there's other things too. Um, since they've started adding so many things they had said before that they were completely against, I don't know, uh, maybe there is some hope for dueling in PvE. Um, I've been trying, again, to play World vs. World recently, and it's just not fun when you're looking for fights. You know, you create a weird build. I've got a vampire necro I've been playing recently, and I just want to fight people on it, but it's so difficult to be in a situation where um, you find another player who wants to fight you, who doesn't just run away, isn't a thief that's just going to SR and disappear on you as soon as you start to win, uh, or it doesn't have a bunch of friends who are going to come and stomp you anyway and roll over you. It's so difficult to get into those situations. Dueling 
brawling and PvE would be, just be so good and add something extra for people to do in the towns and the cities. So I think that'd be cool. Build templates. There's a lot of quality of life things too. Um, a food slot somewhere is something people have been asking a lot of, you know, something for a food, something for a utility. Um, account bags are something I'd still love to see. The idea here being it's a bag that um, is shared across all your characters and inside this you could put, you know, your favorite mini if you don't want to add it to your wardrobe or you could add your trading post, post expresses and all kinds of stuff like that so it's accessible everywhere but it's only very very few slots maybe it's tied to crafting in a big way you know maybe these are ascended bags you have to craft speaking of ascended crafting we've got ascended cooking that we're still yet to see ascended jewel crafting allow us to make um all the uh, trinkets and stat sets that are currently just splattered all over the place and we don't actually have full sets that we can make. That's a constant issue in Guild Wars 2 at the moment. Um, I would love to see an overhaul to the title system that colours them and tiers titles correctly so people can see them better. And there's a lot of guild stuff as well. Like, it would be nice to have the last rep of the guild in the guild panel somehow. It would be nice to have capes come in the game. There's still stuff. Uh, those would be the first things that came to my mind anyway. Anyway, there you go, guys. That's the Q&A for today. Thanks very much for watching. Again, if you have any questions, things you'd like to talk about, leave them down below. And uh, there's a good chance they might appear in the next episode next week. Thanks again. I hope you guys have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow.